I understand that you were in the Navy and did you had to enlist in a doctor in the Navy. Did you, what year did you get in? I, en I enlisted in the Navy in uh, 1962, November 1962. And you were living where at the time? I was living at home then yet. I'd, Where's home? Uh, here in Waskish here on the farm. I'd, uh, I'd stayed at home for two years after I got out of high school to help with the farming. And uh, it was uh, looking like it was going to be getting close to the draft. So oh, okay. uh, a friend of mine and I decided we were we didn't want to go in the army, so we decided we'd join the navy. I mean, you know, both sink. <laughs> yeah, I know. If you're in the I army, you can figured, walk. Away. Figured that out afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, where did you go for basic training? Uh, we went to San Diego. Oh yeah, okay. But and yeah. after basic training, what happened next? Well, I ran for basic training, then uh, then I was uh, assigned to uh, uh, to the sonar school that was uh, right adjacent to the uh, recruiting center there in San Diego, and so I went uh, to a 32-week uh, A school for sonar technician. What do you mean by A school? Uh, they have schools where Navy schools were divided into different classes. Uh, uh, class A school was. Uh, was a school that gave uh, instruction in a specific uh, uh, area of, of technology or whatever. And the B schools were, con were more advanced of that same, in that same what, whatever uh, rating you were talking about. So what was your MOS or what was your job in the Navy? My job, once I got on board ship then, uh, my job was uh, eventually wound up uh, as I gained more experience, uh, as I became the main uh, uh, technician for maintaining the sonar gear that was on the ship that I had, that I was on. So. Now you left San Diego and you steamed into Asia, Vietnam. Yeah. We went to Hawaii first. And, oh, that's and we, so difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We had an interesting thing when we left on that first cruise I was on. Uh, we left on Friday the 13th with uh, 13 ships along with Black Cat Squadron 13. So. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're not superstitious. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, I'm hearing you ended up off the northern coast of Hanoi or Vietnam or something. What, where, where was that that you ended up? And how, how soon when you left Pearl did you get into the waters of Vietnam? Well, we took we left in March of that year and of 1963 is when we let's see. In six, I went in in 62. I graduated from uh, school in 63. It would have been 64. In March of 64 is the first time that I headed overseas. And, uh, we got uh, we got over there and we're doing uh, most of our duties was. Uh, Steaming with a carrier as uh, plane, doing plane guard details and stuff like that. Um, there's, and uh, it was later on in that, that summer then when the it's things started uh, heating up up in by Vietnam, and uh, and we were at at the time uh, it was through that yeah throughout that summer there I guess we just did normal. Uh, simple operations uh, until it, uh, in, we were in the uh, Philippine Islands for R&R uh, &R and for some uh, replenishing activities and such. And, and uh, that was on the 2nd of, uh, of August then that we were going to join up with a carrier task group up by, uh, up by uh, South Vietnam. And uh, anyway, when we were just starting out then, we got the word that the USS Maddox had been attacked up by the Tonkin Gulf. And we were, that was in fact our destination was to go and relieve the Maddox, so the Maddox could go in for some R&R &R too. So, should I explain what the purpose of that mission yeah, was? Yeah, how far behind were you 
one or two days oh, behind two, the mat? Yeah, it took us a whole day to get there, a little, okay. little over a day. And then what took place next? When we got up there, uh, the Maddox had uh, been fired upon uh, by uh, PT boats from North Vietnam. Was it torpedo gunfire or what? Yeah, uh, well, they had yeah tor torpedoes, and uh, I don't know if there was. I think there was some small arms on the ship on those boats too, but I don't know how much, how much uh, if there was any of that activity that went on. I'm, I'm not certain on that. So you were one day behind, and then the Maddox left, and what did you guys do? No, Maddox didn't leave. They the, stayed there. Yeah, the Maddox stayed there, and then we went together. Uh, it would have been, I think, on the 3rd, we went up into the Tonkin Gulf uh, on a normal, uh, routine uh, uh, trip that we would go up into the Gulf uh, and then get up far enough up in there where it was getting so narrow, and they would turn around and come back out. The purpose of our uh, doing that was uh, reconnaissance, some reconnaissance, and uh, of uh, monitoring the, the small craft that were moving down the coast to determine what kind of supplies and stuff were being sent from North Vietnam down to South Vietnam. And then also our, uh, another function we had there was to, uh, we provided a, as a radar, what they call a radar picket ship, advanced uh, 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 station that we monitored, kept monitoring the big airfield, Chinese airfield that was on that island of Hainan. And uh, so we monitored that activity there at that airfield and then would report that to the carrier group that was operating off of South Vietnam, the coast of South Vietnam. So it was a it was an important station up there. It was uh, we had on uh, the ship that I was on had some of the most modern uh, uh, electronic uh, surveillance equipment that there was at that time, and so we fit into that we fit into that uh, need there. So you well. you then went along the the shore of North Vietnam heading southbound. No, we'd be going north. We were no, okay. yeah, we'd be going north up into the up into the Tonkin Gulf. The Tonkin Gulf is an area that's in between the main uh, mainland of North Vietnam, and when you get to the very end of it, then you're approaching China. Then, and then the island of Hainan, then it's a big, huge island, and that's owned by Chinese. And at the narrowest point there between the island and the mainland is 25 miles and the international waters boundaries is 12 miles, so there was a one mile wide slot there where you should be able to get through. But I, the way that I had heard it, that they were, that the word was out that they, they dared us to try it. So, <laughs> so did so, you go through there? No, or no, 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 okay. no, we never ever went through there. So no, we never ever went any closer than 12 miles. Did you get fired upon? Pardon? Did you get fired upon by a torpedo or a gunfire? Well, yeah. It's a, to, uh, I guess to make the story out of it, uh, we went <laughs> when we went up in there on the third of August, and I think we that was an uneventful trip, and then uh, and then when we went up in there on the fourth, then uh, when uh, we were starting to come back out, that would be after dark then, it was, uh, in, the, in the evening, and uh, we got called to general quarters uh, several times. We were a darkened ship. You know that those kind of uh, uh, up on how would you say it uh, forefront uh, precautions that they would have uh, that uh, with that the ship had no lights on whatsoever and uh, no lights showing and anyway then we'd steam back out again uh, during the at during the night and then in the next morning we'd make the same trip back up in there. Why were you called the general quarters? What was the reason for that? Okay, they had radar contacts that uh, uh, apparently were they were concerned about and so they would call general quarters and, and uh, you know I, I was basically I was ignorant of what uh, was really you know what was all going on uh, you just follow orders you know and, uh, the we weren't kept up to date or up to speed on what was going on out out in the, in the waters beyond us and so when they call general quarters you go to general quarters so and my general quarters station was down in sonar control 
and then we'd go down there for a while and then they'd be talking over the telephones uh, over the sound powered phones and stuff uh, of what, what what they were doing and and it was they were monitoring the contacts that they had on the surface search radar and then we secured from general quarters I think we did this three times there that evening and we were they were trying to uh, we have a, every night they have at eight o'clock they have a, a movie on the mess decks and uh, so they were trying to get that movie started and I think they started it two or three times that they tried getting it going and finally after the third time it was getting close to nine o'clock we wound up staying at general quarters and so we never did get to watch the movie uh, it was interesting the title of the movie was the four horsemen of the apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> well now the maddox was fired upon did, did somebody actually see the torpedo or see a wake oh well i don't that, that you'll have to uh, find out from the people that were on the maddox because as we were long ways, you know, we were 200 miles away from them when that happened. But they were attacked right in the broad daylight on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, so they had, they had pretty good, uh, I mean, pretty good it was pretty good, pretty obvious what was going on there. And that uh, when when we were attacked there, when I was involved in it, when the Turner Joy was involved in it, that was a night. It was blacker than the ace of spades out there. It was really dark that night. I remember that. Well, the story is that the Maddox is what started the Vietnam War because it was attacked. And I mm. keep hearing, I don't know if it was gunfire or torpedo or both. Because it was attacked, that started the whole Vietnam thing rolling. Yes, because the, the Maddox, actually, they responded and when they were uh, fired upon, then they, they responded and they sank at least one of the uh, PT boats right that, that Sunday afternoon. There. That's what I heard. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so the, then I, I don't know if the idea was was to intimidate us so that we wouldn't go back in there again or what, but uh, that of course didn't, and I mean that didn't work. We went right back in there the next day. So then when you were there, you still had about a year to go for your enlistment? No, I had uh, that, two years? that was 63. I had two years left then. And where'd you yeah. spend the rest of the time? After after the Tonkin well, let's, golf thing. yeah, let's see. After yeah. you left the golf at Tonkin, where did you go? <laughs> that was interesting. There, that happened on on August fourth, uh, the Tonkin golf experience, and and uh, anyway, we I don't know, let's see what did, oh yeah, we went back in there again then right after that, they turned us right around and we went did the same thing again, and uh, but never ever got attacked again though. And uh, then they came out with the Tonkin. Well, they came out with the Tonkin Gulf Resolution then, that gave the, the authority to uh, uh, do a, a, yeah, start uh, actions against North Vietnam. And so I was in. We were involved in that then when when they uh, the aircraft carrier they sent out planes there and they bombed those six PT boat bases that were along the North Vietnamese coast there. And we were up in in the in the Gulf then as a as a plane guard or as a rescue uh, uh, ship uh, lifeguard ship, and uh, that was interesting when we were when we were up in there on that on that activity. Uh, oh, I can still remember that over the we had our down in Sonar. Normally, we're supposed to be in communication with the with the bridge and other uh, combat stations. With the sound-powered phone system, but we had uh, hooked our sound-powered phone system into the into our tape player speakers, so we had everything was broadcast then in the in our area in our compartment there, and throughout sonar control. And uh, I, um, so I was listening to all these uh, talking about, it, and they I found in, in doing that then I was getting the descriptions of, of an airplane that had been hit and uh, he was trying to get out to sea so he could and we had speeded up we were heading for the area where he was going to hopefully get to uh, before he bailed out uh, to be able to uh, rescue him then and uh, but we had a ways to go I think we were about 40 50 miles away from him at least and, and anyway uh, he didn't make it out far enough he he bailed out and and they, they picked him up, uh, uh, the small boats did. 
and he was uh, that was a his his name was uh, Alvarez, and he was the longest prisoner of war in, in North Vietnam, and that happened on that that was about on the fifth or sixth sixth of uh, of uh, August probably. I'm not I'm not exactly yeah. sure on those dates. Well, on that date. Now once that period of time is over, did you stay in Nam on a boat for a year or more? So, yeah, um, after we after I left, uh, after we got done, yeah, we continued on with our normal tour there. Uh, the only thing is that it was interesting is that we we never got back into port. Uh, port I, where? Anywhere. Oh, a anywhere. Okay. And we, I, of course, I didn't think that much about it, but I guess uh, the only place we pulled in was uh, just before we headed home back to our tour of duty was just about over. And uh, and uh, we went uh, we went down to the Philippines to uh, replenish, and and then we took off for home then, and so then after the after our, the time then we were in the Philippines, uh, and and when we got the word about the Tonkin Gulf incident, uh, from then I didn't we didn't get into port again until I got back to Long Beach, and that was in October. So. It, or in September, it was 40. Anyway, it was uh, four, over 48 days we spent at sea. <laughs> that that last stretch. And I don't know why. They, I got to wonder why they didn't want us and why they didn't want us in any port. But probably they didn't want us anybody saying anything or whatever. So when, once you go back to Long Beach, then did you stay there till you got discharged? No. Well, then I stayed there. We got back there in October or yeah, the end of September, and. Uh, Anyway, then I went, yeah, I went on leave home that that summer, or that Christmas, I mean, and then uh, went back out. And then we just did uh, regular ops uh, exercises and, and normal normal activity. Did you ever go back to Nam? Yeah, then uh, we were scheduled to go back to Vietnam, I think it was in September or something like that, and then all of a sudden we got word one day that... Uh, we were going to be heading for Vietnam on July 15th, and so we headed back over there. That was in '65 that we headed back over again. What they have you do? And oh yeah, when we got over there that time in '65, then then a lot of most of our well, we, other than plane guarding, that was a that was always something that went on was the plane guarding thing. But otherwise, we got involved in a lot of shore bombardment. The ship that I was on was uh, the Turner Joy was the last destroyer gunship built. It was the last destroyer built that had the main armament as five inch guns. And they were the most modern guns that they had at that time. We had three what they called five inch 54s. That was a fully automatic five inch gun. Once, uh, once the ammunition was handled down in the magazine, uh, nobody ever touched it after that. It was all fired, all operated automatically. Could fire 40 rounds a minute out of one barrel. Yeah. Holy five how, inch gun. How about five, five inch Five gun. inch. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of. Oh, it was, they were a fantastic. So they had gun. you firing inland someplace? Yep, 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 for troop support and shore bombardment. Yep. Now, were you located on the DMZ or north or south? No, we had the, most of that, of the firing we did was. Uh, Quite a bit south. Uh, there was one time I remember when we were firing in that the, that the that the um, you know the, the landscape was fairly high, but most of the time we were down south where you could hardly even see the land sticking out of the, and that was one of the reasons why they had the destroyers down there doing that was because the water was so shallow down there, and that uh, with the destroyer that uh, of course. Uh, could go in a lot shallower water than a cruiser uh, could. So, uh, so they were, and then where we had those uh, had those really good guns on it, uh, then we were we were a, a prime uh, supplier of, of firepower. For so, them. how much time did you have to spend in Vietnam when you on your second tour there? Uh, it was seven months both times. Seven about months. Seven okay. about seven months both times. So you just up and down the coast then. Yeah, just and then of course we we'd go into Hong Kong and up to Yokosuka for different R and Rs and Hong Kong would give you R and R. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Well, that was, that's a nice place to was go. Was that Chinese rule or British rule? No, then? that was British rule. Then. Okay, yeah. probably couldn't do that now. No, yeah, I don't know how they do it now. Oh, it's just Chinese yeah. rule is a whole different. Yeah, body. I know it's, it's a different different. So then when you came, then you when you came back to the states the second time, is that when you got out then? 
Uh, it was, uh, we got back this, the second time we came back in the winter. That was in, in, in February, I think, yeah, end of February, I think it was. And uh, then, then the ship went right into dry dock. The ship that I had went into dry dock. And they had to do some work on the hull and, and uh, there wasn't anything for us to do because they sent engineers in from the shipyard to uh, go completely through our sonar equipment. And uh, so there was nothing for basically us to do. So I got uh, assigned temporary, temporary additional duty, I think, they, TAD. TDY. TD, uh, yeah, TDY. Temporary, temporary duty. duty. Yeah. Anyway, I got, because I had a Navy driver's license, uh, I was put on shore patrol. Huh. And that was that was good. Yeah, that was good, Judy. I enjoyed that. That uh, that we had the main the main headquarters was at the YMCA there in Long Beach, and then our the duty station that uh, that I got assigned to was uh, Grand Central Station in L.A. And the I, big thing that I did there was I drove a paddy wagon. We had a paddy wagon that we would transfer prisoners with. This is these are so, wild wild sailors now, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we it was interesting the kind of the duty we had there. We'd go up to the USO. We spent quite a bit of time at the USO in Hollywood, and and uh, but uh, the main or kind of the main things that we did was uh, for any military guys that got in trouble with civilians, and they'd get thrown in jail, and and by the time the civilians were ready to let them go, then they were AWOLs. So then they would turn them directly over to the military, and so we'd go to the jails then to pick them up, and then bring them back to Long Beach. We had a at our station there in uh, at the at the train station there. We had a brig in there, and we'd have to put them in the in the. We had there was a regular setup there. They had a master at arms there, and, or sergeant at arms, I guess they call it, and, and then a brig master, and then then you had your uh, had your shore patrol. There was two of us. Uh, the ones that roamed around, and we car carried a nightstick. And uh, now, when you were there, then that was your last duty before you got out. Yeah, I got. Well, I was I was on that for my word, was it two or three months? I think that I was on that duty, and then I got sent back to the ship again, and uh, and then uh, went through a whole bunch of uh, uh, testing then for uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, for checking everything out after being in the yards. Uh, you had to go through the, uh, I should remember the term that they use for it. Uh, but anyway, where they, uh, where they had to uh, make sure that everything was up to par. And then they'd have some, they'd have competitions then too with the other destroyers. And uh, then you'd get, you'd get um, ribbons that you could put, hang on the ship then for uh, uh, so whatever what expertise that you were What area for. were you discharged in? What well, then I was I was finally discharged then in uh, in November of '66. Well, whereabouts were you then? It was in Long Beach. Long Beach. Then you right. back to Minnesota. Yeah. Then I came back to Minnesota. So. Well, you I seem did. to know an awful lot about the bog because because you yeah. live here, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I should tell you more about that talk and golf thing if you're yeah. interested in yeah. hearing that. You're done right, I am. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, this is my experience of it. Anyway, when we got finally that last time when we got called to general quarters, we went. I went down into sonar, of course, where it wasn't a primarily a, an ASW operation. That was our main What does ASW uh, mean? Anti-submarine warfare. Okay. That's what our main function was, was anti-submarine. Okay. Uh, we, had, uh, torpedo, we had torpedoes and we had uh, depth charges and we had hedgehogs on the, for sub, uh, armament for, uh, for attacking submarines. And uh, <clears throat> we had, so the, it was kind of an interesting ship that it had some of the most modern stuff on it and some of the most oldest stuff on it. It was a, I don't know, it's kind of a conglomeration. We had the most modern sonar gear that was on there. We had the most modern uh, torpedo tubes that was on there, but we had hedgehogs on there, which were World War, early World War II uh, armament and depth charges, which were go clear back to <laughs> who knows when, <laughs> World War One probably. <laughs> but anyway, the, it was a, quite a conglomeration of armament that we had. And uh, the, the, in fact, it's interesting. They had uh, uh, those three mounts of, uh, of five-inch guns, uh, but the most modern ones they had. And then the secondary mounts were old World War II three-inch guns, 
and <laughs> just uh, I mean it, they were all rusty and I mean they were all scarred up and everything they'd come off from some other old ship they weren't new they were they'd come off from some other ship. And anyway getting back to the, the the Tonkin Gulf thing so we had a whole bunch of we have about 14 sonarmen on the ship and so we were all crowded into a small compartment down there uh, sonar control which was down in it was in a compartment that was about right at water level uh, down in the bottom, right in the middle of the ship. And uh, so anyway, when we went, went down in there, then, then of course we were listening to all the reports of everything that was going on and, and it, the contacts that they were having. And there wasn't anything for me to do. They had a, we of course were looking for torpedoes. That was the big thing the sonar was supposed to do was watch for torpedoes. Uh, but this was a, that part of it was a fiasco because we were traveling as fast as that ship would go, which was, uh, they added up to about 32, 34 knots. And when you get up anywhere about past 24, 24 knots, it, the sonar still works a little bit, but by the time you get up to 30 knots, uh, you, it's nothing but noise out there because there's so much cavitation around the sonar dome. And, so our sonar was just about useless, but we were trying to uh, pick up any torpedo that might be in the water. But there was noise spokes coming in from all over. Uh, you'd get a noise spoke, what they call a noise spoke. You'd have a, it would be a steady line that would go. Uh, there was, in other words, there was a lo lo very loud sound that was coming in. And it would show a steady white or a mark that would go all, all the way out to the edge of the scope. We had, a, we had only a small scope that we watched, that we looked at, and that uh, we had noise spokes. They called them noise spokes, and then you'd see them. They would be, oh, sometimes there was 10, 12 of them, and so it looked like you were getting attacked from every direction possible, uh, depending on how, t how you turned up the gain on the thing. Uh, but uh, anyway, they were trying to, there were several times that we, that they radioed in that we had a possible, uh, that it looked like it was something a little different, uh, but none of them ever turned out to be a torpedo. Although they did say they, the the watchman above deck said they did spot a torpedo wake one time, uh, but we didn't pick it up on the, didn't pick it up on the sonar, or it was mixed in with the other uh, with those other noise spokes so badly that we couldn't pick it out. And so anyway, there was uh, more experienced guys than me that were. Uh, there was a fellow that was he was on the stack. They call it the stack. He was in the chair, and then our chief was standing behind him, and uh, he was overlooking his shoulder and telling him what to do, and this and that. And he was our chief was a World War II sailor, so uh, he was. Uh, he, I mean, he had been through a lot of this stuff before, and so this was nothing new for him. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, so anyway, I didn't have anything to do. So one time there, I went over, and I was. We had a radar repeater, a surface search radar repeater down in our compartment too. And we could uh, watch the surface search radar, but we couldn't, and we could control where the cursor pointed and the range that would, you know, the range that would, the scope would show. But we couldn't, uh, we did, it did have nothing to do with the, with the radar up above. It was our own, you know, we couldn't control anything on it except just that unit that we had there. Uh, in other words, we had no control over it. So I was just watching it and observing it. And, uh, and there was, uh, there was, when they'd report these contacts and the, that they had, and uh, the, 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 especially that one time there, I was watching them, they would, they would come in pairs of two. There'd be two in a, in a pair, those contacts. And that one, they'd pull up right along, they'd pull up alongside of us. They were going way faster than we could go. And they'd pull up alongside and then they'd, and then when they were about uh, two miles away, uh, 4,000 4, yard, 4, yards, that's where they would, uh, would be. And then, then they'd watch them then, and then, and then as soon as they would, if they would make a turn, a 45 degree turn towards our, in our direction, then that's, that's, a, that's an attack move, because when they get to 45 degrees, that's when they launch their torpedo. So if you're going straight, and they launch at 45 degrees when they're directly a beam of you, then you'll run into the torpedo basically uh, if they what, that they launch. So as soon as as soon as you'd watch them, as soon as they'd make that turn, then they'd right away you'd do an evasive maneuver. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who was they? 
the what's, what ship was this is your own ship practicing or no 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 this was in the Tonkin Gulf okay this so, was that night of the, of when we were under attack by those PT boats so this is this you're watching the PT boats yeah and if they turn 45 degrees then yep. you want to get then we want to move we want to what you do is you make the same turn you make a 45 yeah. degree turn to the right then the torpedo will go down alongside you instead of uh, yeah. instead of running into you that but anyway then the, another pair that I was watching there, when I was watching, was kind of coming up on our stern, uh, on our quarter, on our be our port left, our port quarter, and uh, that was the ones that I was that I watched them when they shot at them. Uh, I, I saw them there, and it was, how could they see them? It was dark out. Well, uh, this was on the radar scope okay. that I saw. Them. Okay. You could see the contacts. There was two of them again. They were a little ways apart. I don't know how far that would be. They were. I suppose on the radar scope they were... But they, uh, they how they see the fire the, upon them? Just by radar? Yeah, just by radar, yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. yeah, that's the only thing they... Yeah, did they, that's did, the they, thing did they, they hit them? Yeah, I, well, that was interesting. The ones when I watched them there, uh, they they said, commence firing, and and they fired two rounds, and uh, you could see the one round exploded right alongside of the one on one of them, and then the other one exploded on the other side of the other one. No, it was dark out, but the explosions lit it up? Yeah, the explosions would light up the radar. We're, I'm watching the radar. Okay. So I'm down on the bottom of the ship. Okay. I don't see this at all. I'm just seeing these contacts on the radar. And so anyway, then, then they say, after they got those two shots like that, and they, and they were one on each side of them, and then they said, commence firing. And then so then they went into full automatic, then, and then boom, 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 boom. And they, they fired about, oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 times, I suppose. Something like that, and then you could see those shells exploding, and they were exploding right over those two con, right over the everything got bigger and bigger and bigger right there, and then then it all of a sudden then it just all faded out, then faded away then. <clears throat> and there was uh, there was guys that had went up there, and they said they saw there was witnesses there that said they saw uh, sh uh, fire, they saw things burning out there, but it's a it was a it was a screwy deal. It it was a haywire. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of screwy stuff that went on that night. It was really. It's uh, funny. They're interested in hearing that. Uh, well, uh, how come they didn't shoot at you from shore? Well, we were, didn't have the guns. I guess you're too far. No, out. yeah, we were too far out. We were over okay. 12 miles out. See, so that was they were. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and then the, the reason that this thing drug on so darn long, we, I think we don't think we released from general quarters until two o'clock in the morning. Uh, we went finally went to general quarters for the final time about nine o'clock. So it was about four or five four or five hours that we were at this, uh, trying to get. And then all these maneuvers that we would make every time they would have a think that they had a sighting, you know, then we'd have to turn. And, and uh, it was, was there another ship with you at the yeah, same time? Yeah, Maddox was. Oh, Maddox was back with you. Okay. Yeah. One of the things was that one of the things that made this so mixed up is that is that they they were having problems with some of their equipment. And so it wasn't uh, some some of their equipment wasn't agreeing with what what we had what we were showing, and it, you know, like I say it was a it was a jumbled up mess is what it was, and we fired an awful lot of rounds I think a hundred hundred rounds or more that night there with them five inch guns at what at at these contacts that we okay. had out there okay. yeah. I don't know how many they figured they sunk two or some of them figured they sunk a couple of them and some of them said three and. I think there was someone that even figured four that they had. Torpedo boat. Yeah, that they had hit, yeah. Okay. Had, yeah. Did, you ever, ever, did they ever fire inland for any reason? They take out the shore? Oh, yeah. That was uh, when I was talking about the firing missions that we were on before. Yeah, that okay. was all inshore. Okay. In shore. Anyway, the, um, after, that, after that last time that, uh, that I saw them, when I saw them shells exploding over them contacts, uh, it was interesting. If you caught it just right, you could see the bullet, the shell coming out of the end of the barrel on the, on the ship. You know, if the if the radar happened to be in the right spot, you could see the shell going. <laughs> it was kind of, it was kind of interesting. Uh, but that that only I think it only happened once while I was in the times that I was watching them fire that I actually could see got a got a reflection off of the shell as it was going out. So that was that was kind of neat. But. Then anyway, then we had one screwy thing that uh, went on there is that they wound up with a contact that was uh, right dead astern of the ship, and they couldn't bring the guns down low enough 
to shoot at. It, uh, you know, uh, you know, once you get down so far with the barrels, then, yeah. then there's a lockout in them that won't let them fire because they don't want you shooting your fantail off, you know. And uh, so, anyway, they couldn't bring the guns down low enough to shoot at it. And so we were, man, we were making moves all over the place there and they couldn't shake that thing. It kept staying in the same spot. And so they finally said, we, we figured it out. If we drop a depth charge, then that... Uh, what was following you? What they was don't it? know. They you didn't know, know what was there. Oh, too dark. You don't know what it was. No. That was one of the screwiest parts of the whole thing. And so anyway, we had the torpedo men go back, one of the torpedo men, he went back there then, and, and uh, they, when they gave him the word, he rolled the depth charge off. Boy, that was some sound when that thing blew up. It sounded like it hit the bottom of the ship with a great big hammer, a great big steel hammer. Whang, it went. Did that take care of the boat following you? No, I don't think that's, that still didn't help any, I don't think. I think they finally, and I don't know what in the world they finally ever did determine what it was, but... Uh, I had experienced something that I, I kind of think that probably what it was, but I've never ever uh, really never uh, tried to to research it at all to find out for sure. But uh, when one time when we were making a high speed run, uh, when you know just out doing exercises and we were going as fast as the ship would go, and I was happened to be up topside. I don't know why I was there when we were doing that, but. Anyway, I was on the fantail, made it. We had some equipment on the fantail too, so I was probably back there for that reason. But <clears throat> anyway, the, it was an interesting thing, a phenomenon with that ship that about, oh, it, I think it's a little over a half a mile behind it. Uh, the thing will send up a water spout about 60, 70 feet in the air. It, well, now, the what thing you talking about? This is just water. It's a, Come from your own boat? Yeah, from your own boat. Okay. It sends up a water. But rooster that, tail. But a, yeah, rooster tail. And it's about a half a mile behind the ship. I can't figure out how can how that can be that far away. But that's where it is. It's way back there, way back, long ways away. And all of a sudden, here's a spout of water shooting up. <laughs> so and I'm, I'm wondering if they weren't pinging off of that, if they weren't pinging off of that rooster Mark. tail. Because it Could followed have. us no matter where we went, no matter Could where. Could have been. Yeah, now, what's been. the difference between a hedgehog and a depth charge? Oh, OK, the hedgehog, that was a, that was a, uh, there was a whole series of uh, rockets. We had a double mount, what they, a double mount of hedgehogs. And each one of them had on it uh, four times, 24 rockets on it, each one of them did. And uh, they were just like, well, basically they were a huge mortar. They weighed 60 pounds. It was a, the rocket, or the, the bomb on it weighed 60 pounds each. And then it had a, it had a, well, it wasn't really a rocket motor. It was just a, like a fireworks thing. Yeah. Uh, and they sat on a pin uh, that was in a rack. There was a rack there that had four, oh, four yes. saddles in it. Yeah. I and then that. there was pins that stuck up on then There was six of them on each. There were six of these on yep. each rack. And there was two of those racks like that. I even actually got to see them fire them once. In one of our exercises, we actually fired a, a hedgehog round. And then they go, when, when you fire them, then they go off. They don't all go off at the same time. They go off alternately, right. scattered throughout the whole assembly. There's a certain pattern to it. Right. And uh, boy, that's really something when that thing, that was quite a, <laughs> to see all those rockets go ahead and out there and then they fall into the water up ahead. But they go about 200 yards out, 300 yards out in front of the ship, something like that. How far would they go down before they exploded? Well, they, they, they had to hit something before they exploded. Oh, okay. So okay. they had to actually contact the submarine. Uh, if you were shooting at a submarine. So, I mean, if, if it was in the water, going down in water, hit something underwater, then it would go off? Yep, that's what make it go off. It, okay. would, it wouldn't arm itself until it was down, you know, probably 30 feet or 40, 50 feet maybe. It wouldn't arm itself, in other words, so it wouldn't go off. Uh, you don't, you don't want it going off too soon. No, you know. no. So, so any, anyway, uh, that, was a, that was a quite an experience to watch that thing go. But well, that uh, Tonkin that Tonkin Gulf thing was uh, it was quite an experience. It uh, it's kind of interesting, just in my observation of the thing that uh, that they were looking for some reason to uh, to be able to legitimize uh, uh, trying to slow down more of the supplies coming from North Vietnam by attacking North by you know. Uh, having activity in North Vietnam to cut off this, uh, to cut short this supplies coming in, and uh, they were, 
apparently looking for an excuse to authorize them to do that. And so they used this Tonkin Gulf incident, which made a, which caused them to pass the Tonkin Gulf resolution, uh, which which allowed us then to do go and do that to, to them to go and bomb all those bases along the coast there. And they hit a field a fuel depot a depot too that day when they were bombing that. And I guess that was quite a fire. He said. But, uh, anyway, the anyway the. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the part that seems kind of confusing to me is that they used that Tonkin Gulf incident that I was involved in that was that was uh, was, was so fragmented and and so uh, controversial. Why they used that as a basis for their Tonkin Gulf resolution? The attack on the Maddox was it was that done in the middle of the day. That was, I mean, that one there was obviously an attack. There was no, no way of getting around that. Why didn't they use that one as with? To legitimize it, why did they use that Tonkin Gulf one? There's still a lot of conspiracy going, or a lot of discussion going along that 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 that, that yeah. Tonkin Gulf incident oh, yeah. of August 4th was some kind of fiasco. Well, if, if they if it was all put up, they fooled me. <laughs> David, <laughs> thank you for t taking the time to talk oh, to me. Yeah. This has been really it, interesting. It was uh, plenty real <laughs> to me that night there. Well, you experienced a piece of history a lot yeah, of people yeah, didn't yeah. experience. It was kind of an interesting. I don't know if I should even put this on film, but you can erase it off there if you want. <laughs> but uh, when I went up, when I after the thing was over, and I went up to go to the head, and I went in there, and there was a guy up there that was just taking his pants off, and his pants were, his legs were solid poop all the way. He had, he had, uh, he was just a total mess all the way from his butt clear to his ankles. He must have got scared. Yeah, yeah. He was one of the guys in one of the gun mounts. So. I think that's something we'll cut out. Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> cut that one out. But it, anyway, it was interesting to say that because I, because I got a, there was a, uh, well, I should don't know what in the world's her name. Uh, she's a her. Yeah, this is a her that uh, she's a commentary commentator on oh, okay. Christian radio and uh, and and anyway, she made up a commentary about. And in one of her commentaries, she said that this uh, Tonkin Gulf thing, she said, was all a conspiracy. And it was all made up, and uh, anyway, that got me kind of disgusted, and so I, I went and wrote a letter to her, and I told her, I says uh, they just sure did a good job. I said, how real did they have to make it? I said, that, and I told her about the guy that pooped his pants, and I said, did they have to go that far to make it that real? That the, uh, Can you ever get an answer? No, never. Ever, no, you never. Yeah, yeah, she did. She <laughs> wrote back, and she, yeah, she did write back. And she said, well, she said, I didn't mean to criticize the military. She said, it's the, it, was the, it wasn't the military, it wasn't the, at fault. She said it was the, the, you know, the political parts of it that she was actually criticizing. She wasn't criticizing the military at all. So, yeah, okay. it, was, it was plenty real to me. It was, I'm going to go. I don't know why, why they would, how they would go about it. Putting something like that on that would fool yeah. all those guys. How could they do, fool well, all maybe, those guys maybe on the ship? As time goes by, history comes out later and later. It takes a yeah, while. To come yeah, out. yeah. Okay. I know we had it. It's interesting because uh, the chief that was on board there, my chief there, uh, he never believed it for one minute that there was anything that there was a real attack. He said that he said we're we're shooting at shadows. He said there's nothing out there. <laughs> he said there's nothing there. And then. Well, of all things, sir, they called in for the airplane to come and help us, and they and it was an airplane, and I could hear them talking on the phone. I don't see nothing. I don't see nothing. It was that was Stockdale. Stockdale. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Stockdale. Wow. He, he was later on. He became yeah. uh, oh, I know vice president is. under uh, or uh, was running as vice president under uh, Ross Perot. And yeah, he was the one that was flying around out there that night and said he couldn't see anything. Well, that's a pretty good source. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Say goodbye. And, oh, good, oh, goodbye. My word, that's right. We're still taping here. <laughs> <laughs> Should have been saying something. Well, stuff. we'll we can we can we can cut some of that stuff if necessary. <laughs> okay. Come on.